So Tom Steyer, thank you so much for joining us uh, on, on the podcast. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you uh, was the, the kind of shifting debate uh, in America at the moment in terms of the climate and the climate discourse. So obviously over the last decade, we've seen the rise of many social movements like the Sunrise Movement, Fridays for Future, even things like Extinction Rebellion internationally. I wanted to know what those bottom up movements, what impact they have had on your politics and how do you feel like they've affected the wider Democratic Party as a whole in terms of climate policy? Well, so let me say this. You know, I've been working politically on climate for over a decade. When I started working on it, you know, in an open political fashion was over a decade ago on a proposition in my home state of California. It was put forward by two oil companies to basically repeal the most progressive energy laws in the world, which are the California state laws. And everyone thought that they were gonna win and that no one cared about energy or climate or environmental justice. And so I co-chaired that fight and we got 70% of the vote. We you know, really won a resounding victory. And we talked about, you know, you're asking about what does the bottom up movement mean? The reason that we got such a resounding victory is we, we went bottom up. We talked about environmental justice. We had leadership from the black and brown communities in our state where the strongest environmentalists live. We talked about clean air, clean water, and the kinds of good paying organized union jobs we could create with a clean energy economy. And that really was what resonated with Californians. So, you know, that attitude, which is a human based environmental justice based attitude towards climate and environmentalism is one that I have believed in and supported and tried to partner with really for my entire time in terms of fighting for climate justice and more progressive energy policies. Having said that, at the time that we did that in California, it wasn't news in California, but it was not broadly accepted across the United States. So that I think people didn't understand the power of the kind of connection and partnership between environmental justice and racial justice and economic justice and climate. That unless you are connecting these different issues and and avoiding the siloing and the, in my mind, completely inaccurate and misplaced idea that environmentalists are a specific group of people in the United States, which, and to be unfair to characterize them, but there is a, in the press, there's a stereotype about environmentalists, which is highly educated white people driving Priuses. That's not true if you connect this to what really human beings are experiencing in our society, you'll see that the people who care the most about every issue about environmentalism, clean air, clean water, climate, preserving the natural world are Latinos. That the number two group is African Americans and the number three group is Asian Americans. And that's probably because those polls don't include Native Americans who I'm sure actually score near the very top. So once you start talking to the people who care the most, once you start talking in a broad way about how these issues are interconnected and how solving one addresses the other, that's how we actually have a movement that succeeds and has the moral high ground and we have leadership from those communities. You get that, you get all of that, you're gonna get your climate policies right too. And you're co-chairing um, Biden's Climate Engagement Advisory Council, which just announced, um, and the campaign in tandem with representatives from the Sanders campaign have recently published what I think is fair to say is one of the most comprehensive investment-led plans ever to deal with the immediate threat of the climate emergency for a general presidential candidate. Could you tell us a bit about this plan and where you feel it succeeds and maybe some of its limitations as well? Well, I love the plan. I think it's a great plan. I think that it's very aggressive and very progressive. I'll just give you 
three quick points about it, but and then I'll talk about it a little more broadly. I mean, one is a hundred percent clean electricity generation by 2035. That is a great if you know what that means and what the suppositions are behind that, that's aggressive. Um, nationwide net carbon neutrality by 2050. I think that's really aggressive. You know, we're talking about $2 trillion in the first four years from the government, it's basically investing in infrastructure that will spur further trillions, trillions of dollars of investment from the private sector. I think that's aggressive. And, you know, it's a broad based plan across sectors. But let me say this, it does have a huge element of environmental justice, awareness that the United States has concentrated its air pollution and its water pollution in overwhelmingly in black and brown communities and low income communities. And it addresses that directly. But I think the other thing that really reflects Joe Biden's sensibility is it's a huge jobs plan. I mean, it talks about rebuilding and weatherizing the entire United States and building infrastructure, really creating millions of good paying union jobs. And it's got the support of union leaders and union workers. So one of the people on our council uh, in terms of outreach is the head of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, who's very, very supportive of Joe Biden's candidacy and very, very supportive of this plan. So this is a labor friendly plan in a very deep way. And I think that that is something else that Vice President Biden brings to the table is he really does care about and respect and give dignity to working people, you know, sees these issues in a human way. I was describing to you what, you know, the, the point about environmental justice, clean air, kids not having asthma, people being able to cook with water that isn't going to make them sick. You know, those are things that I think the vice president really relates to. He also really relates to creating these jobs and making sure that we are actually putting working people's interest in front, are granting them dignity, are aware that what's going on in terms of this transfer of, in terms of industries to clean energy is going to have real cost to real people and making sure that they're protected. You mentioned there the uh, the nationwide target of net uh, or not or, or carbon free by 2035, which is ambitious, as you say. But one of the things I noted when you were sparring with the vice president on the debate stage back in November was that you said, and I quote, I would make uh, this meaning climate policy, the number one priority of my foreign policy as well. And I know Joe Biden has also spoken a lot about bringing countries together, etc. But I'd like to know from you, seeing as you placed it at the center of your, your policy as well, what does that actually mean in practice? What can a Biden presidency or any presidency do to bring the world together in terms of a, a global climate uh, plan? You know, Freddie, I, to, that is actually the most important question in my mind to ask of the vice president or anybody running for president. It's really important to understand his plan. And, I, and as I said, I think he has a very, very good aggressive and progressive plan. But I think the bigger question is the one you just asked, which is where does it fit into your priorities? Because if some staffer writes you a terrific plan and it's your 10th priority, do you really think it's gonna happen? I don't. And so you're asking in terms of foreign policy and also in terms of domestic policy, where does it fit in your priorities? And I think the vice president has said repeatedly to me, he said repeatedly to other people in my presence, that we are going to have to make this a leading priority of our foreign policy in the first year. That we're going to have to start on day one and get going. Because as you know, the UN has basically said, we have nine years from inauguration day, January 20th, 2021, to save the world. And there's no time to waste. And what, does that, what does that mean in, in practice? What can you do? It, it, well, I think that... Together? There's the easy stuff that, you know, I think for sure the vice president will do like rejoining Paris. 
there will be things that he can do that everything that he does in a domestic space informs people around the world about what our priorities are and what his priorities are and how we're going to, how seriously we're going to take it. But then the question is in dealing with name your country, we're going to have to go to them and offer to partner in helping other countries to the extent they need our partnership, get to carbon neutrality, make good decisions in terms of clean energy. And we're going to have to say that it, it, it's got to happen. And he, I've heard him say publicly that there'll have to be some form of mechanism of enforcement around the world. And so really it's a question of, you know, I used to say when I was campaigning, if you have a meeting, you know, a big head-to-head uh, -head meeting with another country and you bring up climate on the third day, it's not a priority. You know, this has got to be something which is an integral part of our negotiations with every single country we meet with. And that's what the vice president said he would do. And that's what I think it will take. Look, this is a global problem, meaning not just there's a global solution to a problem that affects the United States. This is a global problem that affects all the people we're talking to too. We're not asking people to do something that will help us. We're asking people to do something that will help us and them. And so that, you know, when you look at a country where we're obviously have some uh, tension at the moment, which is China, you know, this is an issue. They're obviously the biggest producer of greenhouse gases in the world. This is something where we're going to have to work with China, regardless of what's going on in the rest of our relationship, if in fact this is going to get solved. And that's going to be true pretty much across the board. There are going to be countries where we have to cooperate on this for our mutual benefit, regardless of everything else that's going on in terms of trade and you know uh, human rights. This is something that is going to affect every single human being on the planet. And we, we don't have a choice about cooperation. And I think the vice president has said that repeatedly. I think he knows it in his bones. And foreign policy is a place where he's you know, very experienced um, and very you know, passionate to get this right. Um, obviously, with foreign policy obviously comes trade deals. And especially when we think about the climate, one of the most contentious issues, especially in the presidential campaign, um, were the candidates that supported the USMCA and those that didn't, especially on the basis of how it treated um, climate change. For example, I think it failed to actually mention the word climate change in, in the actual text. Um, I just want your take on what role you see that having in writing trade deals um, and what kind of policies that you think should be pushed from, from the president in that regard. Look, I, I don't think there's any question but what we're going to have to address this globally. And I don't think there's any way that we can separate it from our other relationships with countries. And I think that that's what the vice president has consistently said, is this is a global problem. It absolutely requires global cooperation and global action. And I think that's what he said he's intent on pursuing. And I think he said it consistently. And I think it's, it, it's really kind of obvious because in the United States, we're 15% of greenhouse gas emissions. If we get 15% right and the other 85% get wrong, and I'm not saying that in, for some reason we're the best in the world. There are other countries who are really aggressively addressing this. But it's clear that if 15% is right and 85% is wrong, we're not going to solve this problem. And it's a problem that has a short fuse. So this is something where we don't really have the option of doing nothing. We really have to get cracking. And obviously, we've had an administration that has withdrawn us from Paris symbolically, has appointed people uh, into environmental positions who are lobbyists for fossil fuel industries and who, who has, under a, a number of explanations or excuses, worked very hard to subsidize continued fossil fuel production and use. And today, obviously, we have a Democratic nominee, like you've just outlined, who has come up with this bold climate agenda. But in the past, you and many other people have been arguing against often the democratic consensus, which isn't necessarily in terms of a bold radical 
uh, green plan. Um, a question I'd like to ask you is about changing the nature of Congress so that it represents the people that care a lot about climate as an issue. But obviously, in polling, we've seen over recent years, again and again, that this issue has become more and more at the forefront of people's minds. Um, we've also seen candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, primary establishment incumbents, to and then win and then put forward this agenda. So I'd like to ask you your opinion on how important it is to back candidates, not just Democratic candidates, but candidates that support bold green politics and what your stance is on challenging incumbents? Well, let me say this, you know, we are, we, we have backed climate champions in multiple ways for years. And I have personally, you know, we have, um, I started eight years ago, the largest youth voter mobilization effort in American history. It was called Next Gen Climate. It, we've, it's been renamed Next Gen America, and it deals with the broader issues, you know, reflecting justice in our society. And we changed that several years ago, and we're dealing with more issues than climate. But we have been backing climate champions for years. In addition, that organization, Next Gen America, in conjunction with the League of Conservation Voters and the Natural Resources Defense Council, started something called Give Green to specifically inform people who are environmental donors about the history of people running for office, highlighting true environmental champions of the kinds you're describing, both at the federal and state level, so that not only do people get a chance to you know, benefit from the research we do into people's histories, but also so that when they give money through Give Green, those candidates and hopefully elected officials know who is supporting them and why. So that instead of it being an anonymous donation from somebody in Schenectady, New York, it's a specific cause-based value-driven donation to say, I backed you because you're good on environmental justice and environment and climate. And so we've been doing this very deliberately and on huge scale you know, NextGen is the largest youth voter mobilization in American history. And so, you know, this year, and I can say, Give Green so far this year. So it's, what's today, the 24th of uh, July. So we have approximately three and a half months to go, which is normally the hot spot. Give Green has managed to raise for direct contributions to people in office so far this year, $26 million. So we're, to, you know, in that we still have a huge amount to go in terms of time, effort, and I believe emotion. So we have backed climate champions. We have refused to back people who aren't good on climate. We are, you know, we're continuing to do that. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the very first thing we ever did at Next Gen America was to wait in a Democratic primary for Senate in 2013, working for Ed Markey, the very author of the Waxman-Markey bill, which passed the House. You talked about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The Green New Deal was presented in the House by AOC. The Green New Deal was presented in the Senate by Ed Markey. So we have been going against the political establishment on behalf of climate champions since we were for our entire existence. That's exactly, you know, we are intent on supporting this ground up, uh, you know, grassroots effort by people to basically stand up for what's right, regardless of who's in the way. And that's what we've been supporting all along. And that's what we continue to do. I think the race of Ed Markey is very important right now because it's not just backing challengers to incumbents. It's actually about protecting the incumbents that are some of the champions that we have for this agenda. Um, I wanted to shift a bit towards many of these young climate activists um, and figures now who are getting elected see climate change as a, as a direct result of wealth inequality and particularly a very extractive capitalist system. I'm wondering if you can give your take on that and if you think that we need to distribute power and wealth 
in order to adequately address the climate crisis? Well, let me say this. Let, let's just take a step back. I know you're asking me about a broad question. Let's talk about how we got here. And, you know, I like to say in terms of climate, we've won the argument, but we haven't won the fight. You know, I think it's very clear. I mean, when is the last time you've heard someone actually stand up in public and say, I'm a climate denier, here's why, what they're talking about is a bunch of baloney. I mean, no one does it. You know, Trump, but having said that, they're putting in actively, you know, active policies that exacerbate the problem intentionally knowing that, but they never go into public with an objective data-driven argument for why they're doing it. So I say, we've won the argument. They won't even argue in public because they're so damn, it's so damn dumb. But we haven't won the fight because of money. And that's your question. And so I look, I think the last number I had was 33% of Republican campaign contributions are from fossil fuels. That's an amazing number. And so what we've seen is, we've seen a political party that is acting against the health and safety of every single American citizen. And in addition, you know, for a while, I really thought this way, I tried to act as bipartisan or nonpartisan as I could. You know, I really thought people don't understand this. So we need to be straightforward. We need to present the objective facts. Not only will this preserve the natural world, not only will this protect the health and lives of Americans, particularly black and brown Americans, but it will also create millions of net jobs, just the way Vice President Biden is saying, that they can be really good paying union jobs, that we can grow faster, that we can have people be better paid. This is a win, 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 win for the United States of America. And I thought, there's no way someone could go against that. It's like, wrong. You know, there has been money at the heart of this, and there has been corruption at the heart of this, that is, you know, in my mind, it's obviously deeply upsetting and distressing. It's why I'm for campaign finance reform. It's why I'm for transparency in giving. It's why I've been, you know, why I started Next Gen was to say, okay, we need to win the fight. How does that work? We need people who are your guy's age to understand how important your vote is, to understand how much is at stake and to show up and swamp them. That's the whole point about next gen. Your generation, people under 35, which includes millennials and Gen Zs, biggest group in America, much bigger than the boomers. And people under 30 voted half the rate of other Americans, half the rate. That's why, you know, people said to us, you can't organize young people, it's too expensive. And we said, you must organize young people because not to do so is too expensive. And so when we think about what's going on, to me, it's straight up political corruption on behalf of the largest industry in the world at that point, basically insisting on the status quo, regardless of what it costs in terms of lives, in terms of health, in terms of the futures of everyone, and in terms of our economy and jobs prospects. And so to me, you know, was that right? That was so far from right, it's just spooky. But it's the system we have. And people say to me, you know, how can you participate in that system? It's because that's the one we have. If we have to win the fight, it's in this system, under these rules, doing it hopefully with integrity and transparency and a sense of, you know, a value-driven sense of purpose. That's exactly what we've been trying to do. That's what we're trying to do in 2020. My sense of urgency is substantially heightened. I'm very optimistic about how it's gonna turn out, but I mean, looking at you, you two guys, let me say this, <laughs> it's on you. It really is gonna be a question in my mind of how many young people who are knowledgeable, smart, and passionate, as a group, realize how much is at stake and whether in fact we get the massive historic 
turnout that I expect and believe in, which is going to show that your generation is taking over, that we're turning the page on this failed revolution that I think started with Ronald Reagan, and that we're in fact going to go to a much more just, much more value-driven you know, society based on, I believe, the shared values that go deeply across America and really let Joe Biden be the transformative president that I believe he can be and I believe that we need. And I think you've made a, a fantastic contribution to organizing and forming that debate, particularly amongst people of my generation. Um, one thing I would like to end this conversation on, uh, which I thought was particularly notable about your presidential campaign, was the stress that you placed on reparations. Now, obviously, many parts of your platform were progressive. You talked about a wealth tax. You talked about the, the, the green investment that we need for our future. But you also talked about reparations, and many of your votes came in disproportionately uh, communities of color, states like South Carolina. Um, so I'd like to ask why you chose to push that as an issue and whether or not you believe that that is something that the Democratic Party as a whole will, will take on moving forward. Well, I certainly hope they do. Because the reason I was talking about it as an American is an awareness that I think is desperately needed of racial, the racial injustice that's characterized our society for at least 400 years. And what I was calling for, and I believe now a lot of people are calling for, is a, a re-examination of our past and how we got here, an acceptance of the need to repair the structural racism that's existed, you know, virtually for the entire existence of America, not just to do justice to African Americans, but also to let our society together deal with this problem and move on together. And so I'm, I, I think the whole Black Lives Matter reaction to the murder of George Floyd is something that's necessary to happen. And I think that it's part of Americans acceptance of something that was, you know, hiding in plain sight. That, you know, if you looked at housing or education or criminal justice or employment or healthcare, there was a deep racial injustice embedded in it that people didn't talk about, but that was transformative to the lives of Americans. And so, you know, I'm watching this process of where, what we're talking about now. People are talking about systemic racism. They're talking about, you know, environmental justice. You know, that's, coronavirus is a, has a huge element of environmental justice in it because black and brown people are bearing disproportionate health and employment costs of the pandemic. And, you know, the other thing, I, for years I was talking about the need to impeach the existing president, that he, there was a criminal element that could only get worse. And if you watch what's happening in America, we're watching the reaction to, to what's going on in Portland, what he's talking about in terms of Chicago and Albuquerque. You know, I think people are coming around to the idea that there is a threat to our democracy right now that is organized and dangerous that you know we're seeing organized attempts to cheat, to strike people off the rolls, particularly African Americans, to prevent people from voting, and to you know set up people to protect the polls in a way that's designed to intimidate. And so, you know, I think we're coming to a place where we're going to need. We have a great candidate. We have a compassionate, caring candidate who's much more progressive. And people understand that's the great thing about that climate plan is there it is in black and white. You know, this is a progressive plan that really does deal with environmental justice and the rights of working people in labor. And so, look, I cared about racial justice because I'm a human being and I could look at our society and see that there was something deeply wrong at the center of it. And unless we dealt with it, it would continue to haunt not just African-Americans, but all Americans. Tom, we really appreciate you taking out the time to, uh, to interview with us. So thank you very much. Um, I think pleasure. that's a good place to end.